Good evening, and welcome to Dante's Old South. My name is Clifford Brooks, and today we have a show brought to you by the Southern Collective Experience and WUTC at NPR. On today's show, we have another interesting lineup of personalities, poets, painters, sisters with a screenplay in the works, and a local producer and director with a film that's all about Chattanooga. Before we begin, I would like to read a poem from my first book called The Draw Broken Eyes and Whirling Metaphysics. And the poem is We Heave Up Like the Night. It's snowing, our reflections stained, captured in clean puddles. We came down tonight like resurrected clerics who followed hypnos above city lights to skip time. Physics bends as we have seconds slow. Strangers are left to window shop. A Desdemona nocturne, the new L.A. woman. She's singing like Nina Simone. Sashaying conspiracy of lyrics and lace. The lady rattles my teeth. Who we were has been misplaced. The sticky fusion fuels our need to be alone. So alive, compressed through my spine, she becomes home, candlelight, anguish, velvet midnight, the early morning hard love and smallest mouth. Palms held out with threaded fingers. We hear the vapid mob. We heave up like the night. I know you'll enjoy this show. And again, thank you for joining us. We have true renaissance lady mrs cheryl taylor how are you doing today very good thank you clifford now i like to jump in with both feet so why don't you tell us a little about yourself and what moves your life i think family moves my life um i'm british obviously um from the accent i moved here about 22 years ago and became an american citizen so we could say that i choose to live here um back to family um i have my feet in two worlds. I have a British world and I have an American world. Um, they don't unite very often, but <laughs> 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 I suffer from homesickness for both places. When I'm in the UK, I miss the US. And when I'm in the US, I long for home as such. And it's a place you cannot name. Is that what you try to capture in your writing? I, d I do reminisce. And I try and lilt the story to something that's tangible as an emotion. Um, we're strange as humans. We have foibles that we don't notice in ourselves, but which I witness, I think, as an observer. Um, I've always observed, I've always been a, a chatty person, but at the same time, I think I see people. Yes, I do what you said. Yeah. When you... <laughs> When you see things, we were, we were talking about this earlier at lunch, and it, it, it piqued my interest in, in your further opinion. In the ethereal nature of what we do, there are things that we see, they're concrete people, places, our, you know, in our travels, the voices that we hear, but there's something outside of that that, that strikes you that you don't know where it comes from. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about that in your life, that, that ethereal portion. Well, when I was creative in the format that I'm a wedding dress designer, um, which was my first career as a creative artist i found that there were moments where you had set it up with fabrics the person that you were designing for um you'd got all the materials around you and then you would set forth to create and i could touch something that you might call a spiritual place but you are totally connected to the universe and in that moment, time stops. You drift into a creative, it's perfect. It's the only way I can describe it. It's extremely light and um, uh, it flows. The creativity flows and you're able to produce something that transcends the normal. 
and you and you can be surprised by the outcome of what you've created because you didn't imagine it quite that way. Now, those moments are rare, and so for the most part, you turn up, and creativity and creative work is hard work and requires skill, patience, and craft. But we all aim for that where we get into the Gulf Stream of creativity. You said something as well about um, that you're, you're, you're not born with the talent. With, how, where, where did that... How did that culminate? As far as you're, you're not born, it's, the, the divine fire comes with you, and you had a way that you said it. Yeah, I don't think you're born creative as such, but what you have are gifts in form in forms of something will stir a passion from within, and that will motivate you to turn up to create. Now there are times when it feels like a barren desert, and nothing will stimulate creativity, but. I find words, words will absolutely move me to want to add another word and I will experience something and witness a leaf on the tarmac and it will look like a leaf of a, uh, sorry, a, a lip and I will think to myself, that's, I need to write about that and why is there a lip on the ground, what is the leaf telling me and, it, and I will start flying and the synapses will create. Now another time I'll walk past and I won't do any of that. I won't collect it. It'll mean it won't stimulate anything. So it's hard to say about whether you're born naturally creative. What I will say is I think things are learned. Craft is learned. I think um, there are people who are genius, but you ask any of them, they will have done that thing of 10,000 hours. They will have repeatedly painted something. They would have turned up to the sunset. They would have researched something. So, yes, you can have a natural creative talent, but real creativity requires you to turn up and work. Because that's work is not a nasty four-letter word. I mean, it's, it's a part of the, of the craft. And I think that you know, many people think that it, and it does come from the ether, but to put that down and whether you're making wedding gowns or poetry or writing prose, um, you also paint and do pottery um, to, to get that, that idea, that epiphany down. That's hours and hours and hours of, of labor and error and getting it right. Well, isn't it like luck, they say, is when that meets hard work, you know, where you put the groundwork in. I remember having a vision, and it was visceral, you know, that thing of such a lucid vision in my mind of something that I wished to create. And the disappointing thing is that, you know, I turned up the next day to create this guardian um, vision that I had. And it didn't go the way I wanted it to go. But I continued to work through the day, rolling out clay and painting. And you put things into the kiln and an alchemy happens, glazes rise and colours emerge that you didn't know would be there. And a quiet piece that I'd made at the end of the day was the one that seemed to carry the context of the vision that I'd had the night before. So turning up and working and being disappointed but continuing to work, I think sometimes can take you to a place that's even more because you bring yourself to it. It's not just an imagined um, art or a, or a finished product. Right. I mean, I'm always playing, when I paint, I'm always playing with light, um, trying to get depth, trying to get um, a three-dimensional aspect to a painting. I start off quite loose and... Um, very abstract, and yet I can end up with a, quite a realistic picture. Now, when I work with the human form, a person will come in and I will see a colour and a, the fabrics and I'll see the dress in my mind, but the beauty of the dress really is only revealed right at the end when we're all ready for the wedding day, when we're all ready. And so uh, all creative um, projects are a journey. So we start, we take one step, one stitch, one paintbrush, one word. It's only when you have a finite date and you know, the object always tells you when it's finished. The bride's body, their way they stand, will tell you the project's finished. And for some reason, it's not necessarily the place you thought it would be. Right. Mm -hmm. We were discussing 
earlier the idea that maybe writer's block was not a um, um, a, a mental obstacle between you and the finished product, but sometimes that the mind needed a break. Do you find that to be the case, that yeah. it's not a block but a break you need? Yeah, I find that can happen quite often. People can cause you to block. And I don't mean um, that in a, you know, but they're nasty or something, but your your need is required somewhere else, you know, family or children. And sometimes I just surrender to that because everything that you have in life actually ends up being a tool to your work, you know, in, in many forms. But I can be dry and not create. And I've, for a long time, I always thought that there was something wrong with me. But I just, <laughs> I just think there are times when you, your mind needs to rest, the creativity needs to rest. And, and then I'll go traveling and I can't stop creating. Travel for me is a window to uh, new worlds. And I come home refreshed. So often I will take myself on a... Um, if I can't do a big travel, like go to Europe or Mexico or something, I'll just go to the next town or I'll go and visit something new. Art, go and see somebody else's art. Go and see live music. Go and listen to a radio show. Seriously, podcasts. Mm -hmm. I listen to those a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the spark of inspiration is change. Oh, <laughs> now you're talking. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, nothing like the new. I was talking about my basement earlier, which uh, I have very creative children, and it's an Aladdin's cave for any creative person. And I defy any um, creative person um, to not produce a store cupboard full of treasures. I collect all sorts of things, bones, buttons, artwork, um, scraps of fabric, vintage things, and I have them in my basement. And... Um, and Marie Kondo is not allowed downstairs. I'd actually probably kneecap her if she tried to <laughs> descend downstairs. But I have creative children, and one of my daughters um, would text me and say, look, I'm coming home to go shopping in the basement. Because I think when you're creating a project, um, you collect things and you then edit out. So without all that stuff, I probably wouldn't be able to do my job. Right. Mm-hmm. I've got paints down there. I can't tell you how many colours, but I may only use certain ones. <laughs> right, <laughs> but right. I still look at them and love them, but they don't. I'm not wanting to put them on canvas. You know? You'd um, rather have them and not need them than need them and not have them. Sounds terrible, but it's true. <laughs> 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 now, with the array of things that you do, where online can people go to find pieces or examples of it? Well, I have an Instagram page and Facebook um, Sometimes I have a website, but I'm pretty dilatory about that. But um, I used to have my work shown at a gallery in Roswell, and I'm currently between galleries, and I've been talking to one of your other guests today about that, how hard it is to find a gallery that will show your work. Um, and the sad thing is I had a gallery where I could work at at the same time, and there's nothing like the artist in work, in studio, being able to show how they do their job, their work and at the same time show their work and sell their work mm. and talk about their work. But, you know, hearing from the artist what motivated them to or inspired them to produce a piece of work is always enlightening, always. And generally sells a piece of work. Right. So, Facebook or Instagram. And, and what, what are your handles on Facebook and Instagram? Uh, Cheryl Taylor Artist um, is Instagram and uh, Facebook. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, obviously, on radio, we can't show your paintings or pottery or your wedding gowns, but we can hear your poetry. Did you bring anything today for us to hear? Yeah, I brought something in today, actually, and it was inspired by the conversations that um, my 16-year-old son had with my husband after they'd um, completed a trek through Colorado. To say that they were excited um, to go on this trek is an understatement. But at the same time, um, Adam was 16 at the time. And at 16, we tend to let, allow our children to go on a trip and they choose where they're going to go. So Adam chose this particular trek and my husband facilitated it. So this poem is written on, based on a photograph that is very, very 
beautiful vision of cerulean blue skies with silver beaches. It's Colorado. And there's a lone figure ahead. And um, one of the voices is my son and the other voice is my husband. Are we there yet? The journey within. How far now, I ask myself, minute after minute, hour after hour, day after day. I take one slow step after another. The plodding pace disappoints my ego. Where's the joy? I take no pleasure on this journey through the Colorado peaks. Instead, truth drives a wedge through my expectations anticipated and the realized frailty of my body under the duress of altitude sickness. Are we there yet? I don't focus my gaze upward to the vast intensity of cerulean blue, dotted with fluffy puffs of cloud. Instead, with head bowed, I scan the red soil for danger. The lure of ascending the distant craggy mountains now feels impossible. At this altitude, a vile syncopation of pain is to be endured with every stride. Breathing is excruciating without oxygen, and gritted teeth restrain vomit induced to rise up. Are we there yet? Spindly pine trees thrust upwards, carried by mountains, and their magnificent massiveness never diminishes the closer you get. Are we there yet? When all around is dignified, the sky illustrious, I feel diminished, humbled by my human weakness and ineptitude, disabled by the burden of the heavy load on my back and the weary pace of my journey. Are we there yet? As I tread where few dare to travel, I comprehend the allure of wilderness's beauty. But travelling its reality is laced with life and death scenarios, not revealed in the glossy image, captured in a photograph. Are we there yet? Cheryl Taylor, it has been an absolute delight to have you on the show today. Thank you, Clifford. It's always nice to meet you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. And second up to bat, we have French expressionist Isabel Gautier. How are you doing today? Good, thank you. How are you doing? I am just fine and dandy like sour candy. <laughs> <laughs> now, to set at the stage, please tell us a little bit about yourself. So uh, I was born in France. I'm French. <laughs> I was born in Normandy, uh, west of France. Most people know that place. Uh, I met my American husband when I was in college. We moved to Paris and I lived there for seven years. Uh, went to the, I took some class at Les Beaux-Arts, Ecole des Beaux-Arts. Uh, we moved to south of uh, France, and in '99, I moved uh, my two kids, my two sons, and my husband to Atlanta. So it's been 20 years pretty soon in May. Um, I'm, um, yeah. <laughs> You're doing fantastic. You're doing fantastic. Now, in all of your travels, um, your experiences in life, from Europe to America. Tell us about your art and how all of that came into your process. Yeah, so I think it was always in, in me, you know, it's, uh, I've, I've always been attracted by creating or seeing things differently or transforming things and using them for something else. And so I took these uh, art classes just because I liked it, not knowing what I was going to do with it. Uh, and when we moved to the States, I um, just naturally took a canvas and uh, began painting. And uh, I liked it and people asked me to, you know, paint for them. And from there on, I, I became an artist, I guess, and I had my uh, own um, business. And what I like is um, expressionism. So it's... Uh, it's, 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 that's what corresponds to me. I can't really paint real and, you know, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> Did you feel, I mean, it, it's been a topic of whether you can choose to be an artist. In your case, it, it, was it something that, that the divine fire was in you, that, you, that it was to be an artist? It's not that I chose. It's that, you know, 
when I began painting, it was really something I liked doing. So at one point, when you have like 10, 20 canvases in your room, you need to sell them because, you know, you, you get you need money to buy some more canvases. <laughs> so from that, you know, I OK, I have to sell them, you know, and find galleries and everything, you know. So then it happened like this, just because I wanted to keep doing my hobby at the beginning, you know. <laughs> that leapfrogs us directly into the next question. Tell us about your art. So <clears throat> my art is, um, it's, it's a personal path. It's not art for art. It's not art to sell, really. I mean, obviously, I want to sell, but it's really me becoming. It's me uh, finding myself and getting in tune with who I am. Um, and... Uh, you know, I'm I'm empty nester now, so I have both time for myself again, and um, I kind of have to find myself again. You know, so it's even more true now. You know, I mean that the kids are gone. So painting for you is is, is the discovery of yourself. Yes, and it's a discover discovery. Yes, but um, you know, I kind of know who I am, but really getting and doing what is important for me, what is going to help me go where I want to be in my life. Right. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fascinating by energy. And when you think about energy, uh, you think about movement and, you know, the activities. And, but actually, I'm passionate by, about energy into, you know, energy that you find into silence, into something that doesn't move. There is a lot of energy, and that's like something interesting for me. Now, from, from there, uh, from the, the freedom of it, to maybe some of the, the, the walls you have to get over or barriers you have to break through, what have been some of your biggest challenges as an artist? Um, well, one of the first one was really... You know, when people were asking me who I was or what I was doing, was just just to tell them I was an artist. You know, just saying that was so hard for me because it was not an, a tag I was, you know, wanting to put on me. I mean, I thought it was like full of aura and full of meaning, and I'm like, okay, maybe not. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but um, that was the first one. But now it's more like you know, knowing how to present myself and. Uh, um, present my art and going to the market and everything, you know, it's very hard. It's um, because it's it's not the same side of my brain which work, you know, when I when I paint, you know, it's like business side and then the the artist side, it's not the same side, <laughs> left and right, you know. <laughs> and we were talking to Cheryl Taylor just a moment ago and she actually alluded to you in this next question. Um, the difficulty in, in getting your artwork into galleries and on the market um, how do you do that? How do you get your art on the market? Uh, you know, it, it, there, um, I don't know. I don't have one way of doing it, you know. Uh, sometimes it's uh, galleries you know, and the owner might be kind of a friend, or you know, so that, that helps. Uh, sometimes it's um, a referral from another artist. And some other time is like, you know, really work. I mean, you do some research uh, and you go and ask for an interview, um, a meeting, and uh, you send your bio, you send your resume, you send everything. That's a heavy way of doing it, you know. Right. But, uh, yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Right. Where's your next show? My next show. Um, so I have one at the end of the month. And it's a uh, fundraising for private school in uh, Atlanta. Uh, it's uh, the school, Trinity School, private school. The show is named Spotlight on Art. It's been happening for 35 years. I think it's like one of the you know, best shows in the Southeast. It's an art market, artist market, art market. And I've been doing it for yeah, um, five, six years. So that is the next one. And then I have one right now in Alpharetta. It's at uh, AC Studio on Main Street. It's a solo show. And I'm going to have on February 8th, I'm going to have a 
a Meet the Artist event. So if you want to come, AC Studio Alpha Reta. And then uh, I might have another uh, sort of show in my gallery in Birmingham in April. All right. All right. Now, to wrap up your segment, can you explain your style and how it relates to the artistic movements in general? Yes. So sometimes people are confused about impressionism, impressionist, and expressionist. So an easy way and simple way to remember that uh, would be... Impressionism is something that gives an impression of something. So an impressionist landscape is a landscape that gives the impression of a landscape. You know, I mean, uh, an art that, and expressionism will express the feeling uh, of the artist. And one, you know, from there it's easier to go to abstract that with impressionism. You know, so my style is expressionist, abstract artist. You know. Um, so there is the expression, expressionism, sorry, uh, from Europe, from Germany, which is different than the expressionism from the U.S. Uh, the artist came from, uh, the influence uh, from Paris, you know, to New York and have it, had it involved or evolved, I guess. So in reaction of surrealism and after the political instability in Europe around the 30s, um, the abstract expressionist came, I mean the, the artists came to New York and developed their own expressionism uh, style. But you had inside of that style, you have the color field paintings like Rotho, for example, Rothko, sorry. Then you have the gestural um, painting like Koenig, but also Pollock. Or, you know, there are different styles inside one style. It's very hard. And even now, we don't have a name for what is happening from the tendency now. It's uh, everybody takes a little bit of that and that, you know. So I think we have to wait now, um, decades to put a name of the tenancy, the contemporary tenancy now, you know, so now it's, a, it's the art is an influence of all the movement that happened earlier, you know, so hmm. um, it's very interesting, actually, when you try to define my style to, to pick three words that would describe it, because it's coming from all these influences, early influences, and even other continents influences. Okay, I have like one uh, series that I call uh, that is Tashism, and is very influenced by Asian art. Mm -hmm. So it comes from everywhere, you know. <laughs> right, and what I hear is. It what I hear in your voice is, is you have fun with this and, and to look at the landscape of what came before and, and to pick the pieces that fit what you want to do. Is, is yeah. that how it goes? Yes. Um, well, for me, there, is, there are two ways of working for an artist. The way of really trying to find the, what works, what sells. And obviously, you, everybody needs a little bit of that. But I really want not to follow that too much. I really want to follow my inner, you know, uh, guts. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And like I was saying earlier, you know, find myself. So I can't follow someone else if I want to find myself. So, but at the same time, I still want to sell. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a balance, but it's, it's my own path. And uh, that's what I like, you know. I love what you just said. You you cannot follow someone else to find yourself. Yeah. That's I, I'm going to steal that from you. I'm going <laughs> to steal that from you. That is so good. <laughs> Isabel, where can people find your work online to see it and possibly get their hands on it? So I have a website, which is www.isabel, I-S-A-B-E-L-L-E, Gautier, G-A-U-T-I-E-R, S, and Art, <laughs> A-R-T, uh, dot com. And that's my website. Okay. It has been wonderful to have you on the show today. Thank you so much, Isabel Gutierrez. Thank you, Cliff.
And rounding out the guests for this hour, we have sisters Stacy Goodkin and Tracy Janich. And they're here to tell us an amazing story that I heard around Christmas last year when Stacy and I were at a party thrown by Cheryl Taylor, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Now, I have come at this six ways or seven to Sunday and cannot and know that I won't do this justice to set the stage. So please, in your own words, tell us about your adopted mother, Maxine Pitzer, and the biopic you guys are working on. Okay, well, we are working on, uh, we have a screenplay written by our friend Sabin Mayfield about our mother posthumously who passed away in 2003. Uh, we thought it was necessary to honor our mother who has raised or taken care of 75 children in her 76 years of life, um, adopted her own natural girls and special needs over the course of our life and over the course of most of her life. And we're hoping uh, or working on putting this to film. And uh, this is what this is about. I think that was something you were intrigued with. <laughs> it was. Um, and and I, I don't mean to be the, the raging narcissist and inject myself into this, but um, I worked in foster care for a few years mm -hmm. um, uh, as a social worker. And uh, when you began to talk about it, of course, it piqued my interest immediately. And what struck me right off the bat was um, that though there was a, a, a deep respect for it, um, there was a thought maybe that, you know, people wouldn't be interested in this story. Mm -hmm. um, I can't think of anything farther from the truth. It's, it's amazing. Um, let's shift over to, to Tracy. When you saw this story um, in its written form, when you felt like it had to get into writing, when people had to get the story in their hands, what finally breached your levy to say it has to be now? Let's make this happen. Um, well, with our family, our large family of eight brothers and sisters, lots of nephews and nieces, everybody wanted to be able to portray Maxine Pitzer's story. Um, never, none of us are writers. It was always a very daunting task. Kind of, we kept pushing it off and pushing it off. And then Stacy and I were also on our own journey to find our biological mother. And we finally came to that, the end of our journey and finding her, closing the chapter on that part of it. And turns out there was a serendipitous event that happened on an airplane that basically set into motion the opportunity to do a screenplay, which was not even something that we had on our mind to do. <laughs> now, Stacy, you were on that plane, weren't you? No, nope, that was Tracy. That was I was on my way home from Northern California after meeting our biological mother. I live in Georgia. Tracy was on her home, way home from a layover in Vegas to Nashville. Yes. And that's where she met screenwriter. Tracy, how did that conversation start? I have to know. Well, it's interesting. Uh, Southwest flight, seats are not assigned. Uh, everybody got on the flight. I got an aisle seat, luckily. Got an aisle seat. Uh, there was a person behind me. I didn't see him, didn't know him. Um, two people got on last. They were a couple. He noticed that they, wanted, they should sit together. So I heard him say behind me, hey, you can you guys sit over here at the seat next to me is vacant. You can have these two seats. I'll move up to the seat where there was vacant in between me and another fella. And uh, I get up and let him in. He's about six foot three, six foot tall guy. And I get up thinking I'm not giving up my aisle seat. <laughs> so <laughs> he sits down and basically his knees are up to his ears. He whips out his laptop and I'm just like, I can't do this. We can't spend four hours on a flight with this guy, this uncomfortable. So I get up and say, hey, you know what? You take the aisle seat. I'm pretty little. I can fit in between. And he was just so grac grateful for that. Um, and then like usual on a plane, you just start chatting. Technically, it was the guy in the window that started chatting over me to Saban. Um, kind of got out of him, out of Saban, what he does. Um, of course, I'm a screenwriter, gets us all to ask, oh, what have you done? What do you do? You know in the entertainment industry, how, what. Um, it got to a point where I was talking to the guy in the window about why I was on this flight, and Sabin's listening, and I start to tell the guy in the window that my sister and I just came off of meeting our birth mother for the first time um, and on our way home, and I was telling him, but that's actually not even the cool story of my life. 
um, it's uh, about my adopted mother. And I start to give him the information on that. Saban is listening in. He starts asking questions as well. And uh, it was four hours of me basically, in short, telling the story of my mom, Maxine Pitzer, uh, having children of her own, adopting five children, and the many, many foster children in, in the household. And Sabin was very intrigued, genuinely intrigued, and said, hey, here's my card. Send to the flight. Reach out to me. I really do want to know more about this story. So that evening I get home and tell Stacy the news. You know, is it true? Does, does this guy really want to know? Uh, five days later, I'm, what do we have to lose? Right. You know? And mm -hmm. who would think a screenplay? That's not something that we fathomed. Screenplay to go to film. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it was like it was time. Met our biological mother, and now it's time to focus on the woman that really, you well, know. The one, that, our mother. Our yeah. mother, yeah, <laughs> that uh, took care of us, raised us. Amazing woman. And got in touch with Sabin. He's like, let's do this. And here we are today, screenplay in hand, and hoping to get this rolling, huh? you know, in Technicolor. <laughs> it's, I can't, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to get off track here, I promise. It, it's just with, with Cheryl Taylor and Isabel Gugier before you, we all ended up talking again serendipitous, serendipitous, serendipitously itself that things happen when they're supposed to, even though it seems like this haphazard mishmash of, of mm -hmm. occurrences. Is, is, did you feel that jolt of, I never saw this coming, but this is right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's why we pursued it. Um, there was no turning back. There was some, a couple of weird incidents on the plane, too. Saban Mayfield, his son, um, was born at the same hospital that Stacy and I were born in Santa Monica. Just before we even get off the plane, we're like, <laughs> that is weird. And <laughs> there was, I can't remember Lots what the Lots of things in common. Just, right. There was mm -hmm. a connection with him. That was right. It was, it was meant to be that we were supposed to exactly. take this next step to move forward with finally doing something with Maxine Pitzer's life. Did you ever feel that when you told this story, people would say, God, you're making that up. There's no oh, way. He did. He didn't, <laughs> Saban thought we were making it up. Now, you said his name a couple of times. Um, what's his name? Saban Mayfield with huh? Stay Fly. Um, he is in the midst of two films right now. He had a feature film, um, Boomtown. Right. And he's done some documentaries, and he's working on two films now that are in the works, which you can find on IMBD, nice. Sabin Mayfield, S-A-B-Y-N, Mayfield. Yep. <laughs> he's from Tennessee. He now lives in L.A. His mother is in L.A., also in the entertainment industry. Um, so, you know, we found someone legit. Right, <laughs> right. Now... With all the details here, um, there there had to have been an, uh, just an enormous amount of emotion involved. Stacy, how vulnerable did it make you feel to, to get this out in the open? Uh, well, we had to go back to a lot of memories. Some were tough. My uh, father divorced my mother when we were young, us being the youngest in our family. And that left my mother with a lot of responsibility which also left us with a lot of responsibility. Uh, but she, she, was, she had her wits and her strength, and she got us through our formative years, teaching us all about inclusion, not exclusion. Um, we're all parts, you know, unknown, but we all became a part of one big machine. And coincidentally, my mom's nick nickname was Big Mac. So... <laughs> <laughs> So there, was, uh, there wasn't any time to focus on our differences because there were differences. Um, there was race differences because my siblings and I and our siblings were different races. Um, our color, the disabilities of the special needs kids, no time to focus on any of that because we were running a household, running a nursery, a nursery mm -hmm. of foster kids. And a um, large variety of animals too, but that's another <laughs> story. <laughs> Tracy? And, yeah. Um, well, I don't know if we actually did mention uh, that the foster children were actually mentally and physically handicapped. These weren't normal foster children. These were people with disabilities that couldn't get themselves dressed in the morning, fed in the morning, give themselves baths. Um, and considering the number of children that came in and out of the house, there were some with, with some really bad health issues that there were actually a couple of kids that passed away in the home that we lived in. 
so dealing with those tragedies too um my mom being the one that was definitely the one hurt more because we were so young but we were a part of it and so uh she had to she not only she had some loss in her life of babies with miscarriages but also had to go through more loss with these foster children that she was taking care of and the animals yeah <laughs> but continued with no self-medication right in her years she was a person who needed to remain lucid at all times she could hardly take her blood pressure medicine when it came to it because it didn't make her feel good so she she did this all without the help of anything extraneous except for people we had a large family so we had a lot of people who could come and help cousins and siblings and you know eventually nieces and nephews so we uh we learned a lot about patience mm -hmm. and strength and what it means to be this kind of a family from our mother. I mean, our father was also in the picture, but he had a separate family at that point, like four years into their divorce. And uh, she, she's the one, she held it all on her shoulders and kept them up for a long time. What I note, first and foremost, and it keeps resurfacing, is that this story is full of happiness and hope, and it has, like, life in general. It has its pitfalls. It has its pain. It has its drawbacks. But this story is not told in the media. It's not. It's rarely told in movies where a family, as you said, of different cultures, different races, um, those with disabilities, different pains, and a matriarch who held the whole family together, you don't, you don't see it like that in the media. Do you feel like that this is going to make a, a profound change in, in just how people understand the system, that it's not always – doom and gloom, but there's a there's an enormous amount of sunlight there as well. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. The, we look back at our childhood, and I don't feel like that we did not live right. a normal mm -hmm. childhood. Mm -hmm. You know, it was normal for us, the house that we lived in. We had many friends, uh, normal school activities, uh, trampoline, animals. Friends mm -hmm. were over all the time. We participated in all sorts of things in school you know we we were part of the normal in our friendships in our family in our town yeah. which I look back and I it is amazing I mean different this, was our normal yeah yes, yes. this is something uh, after leaving moving out a few years later year, few years years later <laughs> It didn't dawn on me until somebody brought it up that there was a stigma about the short yellow bus that would show up at the house to pick up the kids, to take them to their uh, schools, special that, schools, special yeah. needs schools. And it, I didn't realize that. Walking out of the driveway to walk to school and these kids are getting on the bus that other people had a negative stigma behind. Right. I mean, maybe it was just ignorance, naive. Mm, I don't well, know. I just don't think we just are treated differently. Mother allowed that. You weren't allowed to pick out the differences that made you uncomfortable. But then again, I don't think we realized later on, maybe it was uncomfortable at times, but it was only upon reflection. Right. You know, after we were older, thinking back, going, wow, that was, that was kind of weird. <laughs> Pouring out of the van with all of Pouring us. Pouring out of the van. <laughs> and all the kids that Twelve kids, right. Right. couldn't speak or talk right. It had Down syndrome or mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, they had uh, it just we walked with them you know we went to the pizza parlors with with them we went to the snow with them in Disneyland or wherever and mm -hmm. didn't think twice about it mm -hmm. because that was our normal yeah now circling back around where we already are as far as with family in telling this story of Maxine Pitzer did you reach out to other family members to tell her story to get other perspectives yes and that was fun because they all wanted to share their memories of their mom, our mom, and uh, they were real excited to hear that this was moving forward. Because mm -hmm. like Tracy said previous, we've all had it on our mind to recognize our mother posthumously, but how and when and who, who's gonna do this? Mm -hmm. I think we're all waiting on each other to you know, make that move. So they were excited. Yes, and still are. <laughs> good, good, good. Yeah, we wonder why. They wanted to see something done. <laughs> why, 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 why are we the ones that were picked to do it? <laughs> now, Stacy, being on the radio, I have to ask, and seeing this screenplay as a movie, 
Uh, do you have a soundtrack in your mind of what might be on it as it plays out for the public? Yes. My mother was a big fan of gospel music, especially country gospel. Um, we would hear her singing the sweet by and by, um, down to the river to pray. She was the youngest of 14 from a family in Oklahoma. And um, her mother was, you know, she was raised with God and, and Jesus. And that was her, I think that's what her, how she was so courageous. Um, she, Jesus loved the little children, of course, was one of her favorite. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so we thought this country gospel music was ideal. Uh, Simon and Garfunkel, while it's not country, that was something she, we, we listened to all the time. Mm-hmm. And Elvis. Yeah, all things Elvis. All, the, all, all things, things Elvis. Elvis. Well, she just loved Elvis, yeah. you know. I mean, if she could marry Elvis, she would have. <laughs> <laughs> Mandrell Sisters, that was a regular favorite when we were growing up. And the connection with oh, and Dolly Mayfield. Oh, yeah, and Sabin Mayfield's um, aunt is Dolly Parton. Mm-hmm. Shut up. Yeah. For real. For real. <laughs> That's right. So we were thinking something along that line. All right. You know, something that we could imagine our mom listening to. And Grease. Mm-hmm. Remember? She loved Grease. <laughs> <laughs> Not country, but wow. Well, she still liked it. Current music. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right. <laughs> now, is there anywhere online that they can go, the public can go to, to, to follow this story or to follow you? Well, we uh, have a small snippet on IMBD, but we're working on making this a larger project. Okay. I mean, this is fairly new. We do have a pitch deck in place, so right. that way we're ready to or provide, that. provide this to anybody that does have interest. Um, start to get somebody who wants to produce it with us. Um, Sabin's working on that, of course, because he, he's the expert in that, on that side of it. But we're definitely producers, too, on this. Well, thank you so much, Stacy Goodkin and Tracy Janich. Thank you for having me. We were going to have you all back on in due course as soon as something pops up um, in the story because this is something that we need to follow through with. Looking forward to it. All right. Going to have some Thank good you. news. Thank yes, you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again for tuning in to Dante's Old South. My name is Clifford Brooks. And before we close, I would like to give a special thank you to the Woodbridge Inn in Jasper, Georgia, and to remind everyone that in, on March 9th, 2019, the Southern Collective Experience will be putting on a workshop and lecture series called Living the Creative Life. If you're interested, it's just a short drive away in Canton, Georgia, and the website is www.southerncollectiveexperience.com. God bless you all.